read for them for us. The Bible reading today is from Acts chapter 10, verses 24 to 33. The following day, they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and falling at his feet, worshipped him. But Peter made him get up, saying, Stand up, I am only a mortal. And as he talked with him, he went in and found that many had assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now may I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius replied, Four days ago at this very hour, at three o'clock, I was praying in my house when suddenly a man in dazzling clothes st stood before me. He said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying in the home of Simon, a tanner by the sea. Therefore, I sent for you immediately and you have been kind enough to come. So now all of us are here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you would open this word to our hearts, that we might hear your voice speaking to us, and that we might respond with the help of the Holy Spirit to your praise and for your glory. Amen. Well, as Darwin said, last weekend we were in or back to TSK School across the way there. Uh, we gathered together our eight congregations uh, from various places and within this building to be together for that communion service. It was World Communion Day, a time for unity. And it was good to see, I think we nearly filled all 700 chairs or so, and thank you for risking the transport disruptions to get there, and pray you all got home safely after the service. It was a good time of being together, recognizing what a multicultural, multi-everything this congregation, this church of MIC truly is. And it was good to be together to express our cultural and uh, significant differences in that one service of unity around bread and wine. Uh, so we continue this week with our series on uh, Jerusalem to Rome. Uh, Acts of the Apostles, written by Luke, Dr. Luke, who also wrote Luke's Gospel. And uh, I wanted to stop and just do a little review of some of the things that have been the strands that have been running through these first 10 or 11 chapters of Acts, and just for us to think about them. I hope uh, many of you are still using your little uh, books to make notes in. I am, uh, as I daily pray my way through this book of Acts, and as I preach my way through it, uh, I'm making some little notes of things that are stirring me, or God is speaking to me, or I'm listening in the context of how I'm living at the moment. So some of the strands that really have come out of Acts of the Apostles are these. First of all, uh, the beginning of Acts begins exactly the same way that Luke ends his gospel with the ascension of Jesus. So Luke writes his gospel. He's meticulous. He's a doctor. He wants uh, evidence. Uh, he wants to be an eyewitness in the Acts of the Apostles. And when he finishes his gospel, it finishes with the ascension. And then when he starts his next book, Acts, it begins with the same story. And I suppose there's maybe two reasons for that. There may be more, I'm sure there are. But the two I think of are these. Many of us watch uh, sitcoms or dramas that go on night after night or week after week. And quite a lot of those back in the UK, I remember, they would begin with a kind of roundup of what happened the week before. So that you could be reminded how it ended. What was the cliffhanger they left you on in anticipation of the next episode. And I think Luke has something of that about his letter in Acts. He wants us to be reminded of how the gospel ended. <clears throat> the life of Jesus, the story of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and the ascension of Jesus back to heaven. 
And he reminds us of that final part again. Because it's really important. And quite often the church brushes over Ascension Day. Sometimes we barely even notice it. But the ascension of Jesus back to heaven is really quite important. Because it tells us something of the significance of who Jesus is. And Luke wants to remind us of that by reminding us of the story of ascension. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is glorified, magnified and exalted to the right hand of God, the highest place that he could sit. You remember James and John in one gospel uh, ask, in another gospel it's their mother asking if they can sit on the left and the right of Jesus in the coming kingdom. And he says, that's not for me to tell who sits in that place. But as Jesus ascends back to the Father, he sits at the right hand side of God. This exalted, glorified place. That's how important Jesus is. And he sits there praying for you and for me and for the gospel, the good news to go out into all the world. And this reminder of the holy significance of Jesus is essential in the book of Acts as it gets going. Because as we've seen over the previous few weeks, over and over and over again, we hear the phrase, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Be healed in the name of Jesus. You're saved in the name of Jesus. Peter says it. John says it. Stephen says it. Philip says it. And the name of Jesus, the person of Jesus, is powerful. He ascended back to be with God the Father and sits at his right hand. And it reminds us that all that we do and all that's happening in the Acts of the Apostles, it's not in my name. It's not in Peter's name or Philip's name or John's name. They're not the celebrity preachers. They're the disciples and apostles. It's in the name of Jesus. Don't bow to me. Don't kneel to me. Don't. It's the name of Jesus. Sins are forgiven. The gospel is preached. The sick are healed. Signs and wonders, not in my name, not in my power, not what I can do, but in the name of Jesus. And that's really important because the second thing that we've learned is that the Holy Spirit is given not to glorify us, not to make us look great and powerful and mighty and given street cred. No. The Holy Spirit is given to men and women to glorify God and God alone. When I look at preachers, sometimes I look at them and say, this is all about you, isn't it? This is all about you. Well, I don't see God in you. I just see you in you. That's why I wear these cheap suits. <laughs> have cheap suits made, nothing flashy. <laughs> You're getting a bit worn. Because I don't want you to see me. I want you to see God. Uh, the words that I bring are prayer, not pray, not God's, not my words, but God's words. And that through me, you might be pointed to the living God. I can't do anything, not my power, not my strength, not my fancy words, but God's and God's alone. And you know, if you make this all about yourself, you will certainly fall, as many great and wonderful celebrity preachers have over the time. It's too much about them. And then the devil gets in. So this is not about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about making me look good. This mighty, powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit, these gifts that the Holy Spirit wants to give. It's about glorifying God. It's about pointing people towards God. If you say signs and wonders as the early church did and as we do, then that's God. Let's glorify God. Let's worship God. Let's enter into a relationship with the God who makes these things possible and happen. The singing. When we get to glory, what a marvelous song. I see my mother. She's not dead yet. <laughs> She's still alive, but she was last night when I spoke to her. <laughs> but we'll see those people have gone before us. Amen. That's a great song. Great song. And that's what we're looking for. As God comes to us, uh, that we find that way to eternity. You know, eternity begins now, of course. We're not waiting for 
the casket <laughs> and the grave. Eternity begins now for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ. We've entered into it now. We are living it now. So one of the strands that goes through the Acts of the Apostles is this is all about God. It's all about what Christ has done. It's all about the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not about apostles or disciples or preachers or teachers. It's about us pointing towards God. Uh, Thirdly, it's clear from these early chapters of Acts that it's perfectly possible to come to faith in Jesus Christ and and yet not experience the fulfilling or the filling of the Holy Spirit and the empowering and the blessing and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's perfectly possible to come to faith in Jesus Christ, to be baptized in Jesus Christ, and yet not receive the filling and the blessing of the Holy Spirit. And you know, that's a bit like having a beautiful car and you polish it and look after it, take care of it, it's meticulous, glorious, beautiful, but you never put petrol in it. So it never goes anywhere. You can sit and admire it and delight in it, but that's it. It goes nowhere. You know, when I walk from here where I live along to the supermarket, I walk past the Rolls-Royce garage, the Tesla garage, the McLaren garage, all really useful local shops, I have to say. (laughs) Uh, And and, uh, I sometimes maybe gaze a bit too long at some of them, particularly those McLarens. They're beautiful, aren't they? Maybe I cover them a little bit, then I turn away. But that's what it's like for so many people in the church. Uh, You know, they're they're like looking at faith through a glass window. It's beautiful, meticulous. You polish it, clean it, but you never work it, never drive it, because it's never full of the petrol, never full of the Holy Spirit. And that's what God wants to do for all of us, you know. Some people go to church because it feels good, feels right, you know, that's what I do on a Sunday morning. But it's more than that, it's more than that, much more than that. The apostles lived with Jesus, they learned from Jesus, they came to realize who he was, and they believed in the power of his name. They, they met him risen from the dead and he spent some days with them, teaching them about all that was to come and what was to happen now. But they still had to wait. Jesus said, now go into the city and wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. They knew him. They loved him. They served him. They saw him in his resurrected state. They were followers. But they had to wait for the coming and the gift of the Holy Spirit And when the Holy Spirit fell upon them on the day of Pentecost, wow, they came alive. That car sprung into life with a roaring engine. And out they went into the world. When Philip was sent to Samaria in chapter 8 that we looked at two weeks ago, he preached the gospel and many came to believe in the name of Jesus and were baptized. But Peter and John came later to support Philip in his work. And they looked at the people and said, You all need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 8, verse 6, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Baptism is really big in Hong Kong, not so big in the UK. Baptism can open doors to all sorts of things in Hong Kong, getting into schools, funeral services. Are you baptized? It's a question I hear all the time. Anybody can be baptized now. Anybody can go down into the water and come out again and profess things. What God is saying to us, and what here we find in Peter and John saying to these early Christians, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You've received Christ. You've come into the kingdom. Now let the Holy Spirit fill you. And they prayed, and all these people are filled. And Simon the sorcerer is there, you remember, making his money out of sorcery. But he's also become a Christian and baptized. And when he sees all these things happen, he says, oh, give me that. And Peter has a word of knowledge saying, you are looking for the wrong things. You think you can make money out of this. But when I look at your life, you are bitter and full of sin. And before God can fill you, you need to be transformed and renewed. And fourthly, it's perfectly possible to believe in the name of Jesus Christ, but still have a very long way to go on that journey of faith. When I was a youngster, I was 
converted as a teenager. I told you this story before. And, and those conversations around that time of conversion, when Billy Graham was so big in the UK and thousands were going forward onto the football pitches to, to give their lives to Christ, it was all about, is that it, you know? Is that all we need to do? Get to that point of praying the sinner's prayer, receiving Christ, and that's it. That's it. And I guess some of us thought that was it. You were in. That's it. The deal is done. It's sealed. But of course, that's not true, is it? Ananias and Sapphira, the Simon the sorcerer, show us that in the early uh, chapters of Acts, faith is a journey. Coming to pray the sinner's prayer and being baptized is just the beginning. Then we're called to, to worship, to serve, to love, to grow, to become more and more like Christ, to allow God to work in our lives day by day by day, to change and grow and become more like Christ. But I think sometimes some of us step in through the door and think that's it. We're in. We made it. We're going to heaven. But there's so much more. And we must be very careful that in accepting the name of Jesus, we don't fall into the trap of thinking that's it. It's all done. Now I can carry on with my old life again. And we need to recognize, and I learned this very early on as a pastor, that just because someone responded to the call of Christ and attends church does not make them holy. Some of the most sadly unholy, unlovely, unforgiving and bitterest people I've ever met have been members of churches that I've been the minister of. None of them here, of course. <laughs> but in other places, certainly. I've just been back to uh, Vietnam, where I was before I came here to try and help out with a situation where a leader has really gone off the rails, but he thinks he's fully on the rails. Corruption, breaking away, setting up his own church, calling himself a bishop, a catalog of things that this person who says he's a member of the church, who believes in Jesus, trying to get them back on track. Just because we've given our lives to Christ doesn't mean to say that we are perfect in every way. It's a journey, and it will go on and on. And that's something that's very clear in the Acts of the Apostles. With those early apostles, they had to learn really quickly what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. And fifthly, with faith comes persecution. We've looked at this too. Hardship and at times severe testing. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, Luke does not shield this stuff from us. He puts it clearly in the book, in his book of Acts. Persecution will come. The apostles were flogged and beaten and imprisoned. They were brought before courts and great groups of people to testify. And Luke is telling us, weigh up the cost of following Jesus. And Jesus told us to weigh up the cost of following him. There would be a cost. It wouldn't always be easy. And maybe these days in Hong Kong, reminding us it's not always easy to be a Christian and to follow. And perhaps one of the final things that I w a strand that's run through this Acts of the Apostles is the whole strand of prayer. Every verse, every chapter, is full of prayer and prayerfulness and prayerful living. In waiting, the apostles prayed. In persecution, they prayed. In hardship, they prayed. In relationship struggles, they prayed. In choosing leaders, they prayed. In celebration, they prayed. In deciding strategy, they prayed. In seeking direction, they prayed. In evangelism, they prayed. Prayer, 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 and more prayer. The apostles are steeped in it. They love it. They enjoy it. They're enlivened by it. They can't wait to be together, to pray together. It's the air they breathe. As the Holy Spirit comes upon them, as they're empowered, as these extraordinary things unfold before them, they're again and again and again thrown back upon prayer. And we know all know, don't we, how easy it is that when life gets busy, the first thing to disappear is prayer. When life gets tough or there's struggle or hardship, Prayer goes out the window. But here we find it foremost in life and in the church and in the apostles. Prayer, prayer, and prayer. 
the Holy Spirit brings life to the story and the message and the life of Jesus. The Holy Spirit breathes life into that story, bringing it alive for the apostles and for all who hear it. The Holy Spirit breathes life into those dry bones and makes them live again. And the Holy Spirit can do that in our life too. The Holy Spirit breathes power into us when we are challenged by the gospel and by the demands of the gospel. And be sure the gospel will challenge us. It will make demands upon us. The gospel will breathe life into us when we open ourselves and say, yes, this is all about you, God. This is all about you, God. I have to tell you that these present days in Hong Kong are amongst the most challenging days probably many of you, certainly I, have ever encountered or had to live through. After 20 plus years of ordained ministry, I was beginning to think there's nothing more that's new, no experiences to be had that I hadn't already seen or witnessed or gone through. And then suddenly, this. And you know, colleagues and others sometimes ask me how I think MIC is doing, how I think it's going, especially if we go through a little bump in the road. And I say, oh, it's fine. I'm very nonchalant, perhaps. It's fine, it's fine. It's moving along exactly as I hoped and prayed and expected it to. And I've seen it before in other ministries, in my other previous ministries. This is what we go through. We'll get there. And then it's like Hong Kong and MIC has hit an iceberg in an ocean. Without any warning or preparation, a giant iceberg popped up redented but not sunk, praise God. But what are we to do? How are we to respond? I have no past experience to dredge up, no previous knowledge, no theological seminar that I attended, no books or academic papers to quickly reach for. And so we're plunged into some uncertainty at this time, unsure of what we should do, how we should respond. We've never been here before, not quite like this. And so what do we do? Where do we go? We're thrown back upon God, upon prayer. We study and search the scriptures and pray and worship and seek dialogue and advice and use our God-given intellect, enlivened by the Holy Spirit. And everything at a time like this, as you know, is sensitized, isn't it? Ordinary, benign things take on an extraordinary new meaning. Umbrellas and face masks, colors, post-it notes, ordinary things are given extraordinary meaning. Rather like bread and wine, that's the center and the heart of our church community. Bread and wine transform to the body and blood of Christ. A British comedian was visiting last year and he was doing his gig at the Expo and I went along with some friends and he appeared on stage wearing a mask and making jokes about Hong Kongers in lifts. And how Hong Kongers are always, when they get into a lift, they're always pressing the close the door button as quickly as they can. And we all laughed because we've all seen it. I mean, I, we're all there. We want those doors to close as quickly as possible. We can move as quickly as possible. But this year, he wouldn't come and start in quite the same way, would he? Because it's all different now. Words are sensitized. What we say or what we hear maybe was not what we meant or what that person meant. Everything has changed in Hong Kong because our social context has changed. It's like putting on a pair of glasses and seeing through a different lens now. And the challenge to the church is even greater. Who's in and who's out? As we thought about a couple of weeks ago, how far does our radical hospitality extend? And the question was right there at the heart of the early church. Who's in? Who's out? And we are challenged when we see the Ethiopian eunuch becoming a convert. Simon the sorcerer finding Christ. Cornelius the Roman centurion who, was, who we read about in these chapters. He shouldn't really be in the story. Surely they're misfits, socially unacceptable. Surely. But if we are shocked and surprised, how much more were those early apostles, steeped as they were in their Jewishness, shocked at what Jesus was commanding them to do and to accept? Yeah. 
we see Gentiles becoming Christians in these chapters of Acts. And one of the prayers that is prayed by Jews, and some rabbis advocate it being prayed every day, is blessed art thou, O God, that thou hast not made me a Gentile. The eras before the birth and after the birth of Jesus are full of the persecution of Jews. The Seleucid Empire, a thousand year, hundred years before the birth of Jesus, outlawed Jewish festivals, broke down their altars, or made Jews worship false gods on those altars. They banned circumcision. They tried to annihilate the entire race. Emperor Hadrian, after the birth of Jesus, tried to do exactly the same, banning festivals, uh, making circumcision illegal, breaking down altars, imposing a huge poll tax upon them to wipe out the race. And now, Cornelius is coming to Peter, a God-fearer, one who believes in the one true God but cannot be a Jew. He can be a God-fearer, though, and his family And he's very kind and charitable and gives money away. And because of that, God hears him and said, a man will come to you, reveal to you the gospel. And it will be Peter, Peter the Jew, impetuous and strong and powerful, driving force for the new gospel, but Jewish. And so on his way, he too needed a vision. If he was really going to go to Cornelius' house, the kind of Gentile enemy then he too would need to hear God speaking. And in a vision that night, a sheet is lowered down and there it's full of animals, all the animals that Peter has never been able and allowed to eat by law. And God says, take them up, eat them. But they're unclean. No, nothing is unclean now. And so the next morning when he wakes up and those men arrive from Cornelius' house, he's ready to go. I don't know how he feels, though, going to meet with the Gentiles, whose very shadow cast across him would make him unclean in former days. Gentiles, the enemies of Jews, who tried to eradicate them completely. But he goes because God has spoken to him. And Cornelius receives him into his house. And Peter says, you know, I shouldn't be here, but God has shown me a vision that nothing is, nothing is unclean, nothing is beyond the kingdom. Even my enemies are welcome in. And Peter preaches, and they are all converted and baptized. And when Peter gets back to the church in Jerusalem, they're up in arms. They're tearing strips off him. What are you doing in the Gentile territory? Why did you go to that house? And he has to tell the church the vision is had and what God is doing and what happened in that place. And they all rejoice and say we can do nothing then but praise God for this new opening. We live in a time when people are torn and people are divided at the moment. People find themselves in polar opposite places and it's breaking our community, it's dividing. And I wonder in these days, as I listen to this story of Peter and Cornelius and the power of the Holy Spirit, who are the people that I need to be more radically hospitable towards? Who are the people I disagree with? Who are the people I can't stand for what they're doing? They're the people God is saying, welcome them, welcome them in. Who are my enemies? Welcome them. They're part of the kingdom of God because they're made in the image and likeness of God. So as we go through this book of Acts, it challenges us. It reminds us of the power of Jesus, ascended to be with God in heaven, praying for you and praying for me, and praying for the success of the mission. The Holy Spirit is given, poured out abundantly, powerfully, not to glorify me or you, but glorify God. We can come to faith, and we can just sit there and do nothing, 
But that's not real faith. Because faith will encourage us, draw us, invite us to serve God. We can sit there and never receive the fullness and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what God wants to give to you. So that you can be what God wants you to be and God needs you to be. Persecution will come, so we need to pray. And today, we need to be open to recognize the gospel is for everybody. The church has not been good at being for everybody. The church has been very bad, in fact. We know who's in and we know who should be out. But this is the challenge for the church today. Who are those persecuted minorities living amongst us or in our world? Who are the ones that the opposite ends of the spectrum from us? Who are the enemies? They are the ones that God is saying to us, the kingdom of God is for such as these. Our job is to proclaim, to live, to love, to be filled with grace and mercy and let God deal with the rest through the cross of Christ. Not in my power, but in God's power alone. And let us pray. God, it's a great challenge. Peter must have been hugely challenged by that call to go to Cornelius' house, Gentile house, full of Gentiles, and all that Gentile nations had done to the Jewish people. Yet even in the life of Jesus, we see the way that he went into that Gentile territory to bring healing and restoration, to take the gospel. And God, we know that we cannot shy away from this part of the call. So show us, God, in these days, who are the ones you're sending us to? Who are the ones you need us to go to? Who are the ones you need us to to love rather than criticize? God, fill us with such love that we could fulfill this calling to serve you, to be witnesses. And Father, don't just let us sit in this church week after week listening, but Lord, help us to open our hearts and minds to receive again and again the infilling and empowering of the Holy Spirit that we can truly become all that you want and need us to be. Father, we thank you that your love is amazing. It is extraordinary. Your love is there and it's constant. It will never let us go, but will hold us firm. And so, hold us, O oh God, and help us to reach out to the world in such need with your love and grace and mercy and reconciliation that all might know that love and find peace in their souls. For we ask this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Signal 8 are going to sing that beautiful song to us, O love that will not let me go.